Welcome to Rethinking Politics, episode 20. Today we're going to be discussing exit polling. Woohoo! Exit polling, if that, I know if that term doesn't just fill you with wonder and excitement, it's probably because you haven't spent enough time staring at the data. I, I remember the first <laughs> time the data for an exit poll was put in front of me and I was like, hmm, these numbers are uninteresting. <laughs> but as you get into them, and as you look at them closer and, and see the breakdown and you get you get some good exit poll questions that actually uh, suggest some of the trends, they become extremely interesting. They are extremely interesting. And as we as we come away from this election, with Joe Biden now as as the confirmed winner. Well, not confirmed. That's too strong of a term with with <laughs> Joe Biden as the projected winner of this election. You know, we're going to have to to wait for all of the votes to be tallied for it to be officially confirmed. But that takes a long then, time yeah, in every election. I was say, and then, then recounts in some of the states have uh-huh. already said they're doing the recounts and then the court cases uh, that are going to try and look at voter fraud and those kind of things. Yeah, it's – It's, it's going to be a drawn-out process. It's a journey. It is definitely a journey. But but even before all of that is 100% resolved, we've already gotten a lot of data – that tells us some very interesting things about this election versus other elections in the past. And so we're yes. excited to talk about some of those facts and figures and some of the trends and implications of those facts and figures because it is very, and in often cases, unexpected information, things that I was surprised about. Right. This is where, this is where the game of political strategy really begins for the next elections for the upcoming elections because the information you get out of exit polls is better than any information you can get from normal polls and there's a couple reasons for that first let me point out how exit polling is sometimes used that is semi-reliable now if you're watching an election night often people will talk about the exit polling that's happening live on the ground exit polling is of course when people leave the polling office where they just voted they're asked questions they're interviewed, they're surveyed. And a lot of the times people try and use that information as they're gathering it to predict the outcome of the election, right? To see how many Republicans have actually showed up in such and such district and and what's going to happen because of that. That's useful information, but it's not going to be perfectly predictive, right? You, You may get people who show up at different times for different reasons. There may be more Democrats who show up at some point and more Republicans that show up later. It's not necessarily an even predictor. So while it's helpful to get that picture of how things are developing live in the election, it's not actually perfectly reliable for that. Helpful, not something that's going to give you the picture 100% of the time. But if what you want to do is see after an election is done, or done-ish, whatever we (laughs) want to describe this election as, if you want to see why people voted, and who voted for who, and what they say motivated them, what their what their level of education was, what their race, what their gender, these kind of questions, these are captured in the exit polls. And it's critical that the exit polls are better than other polls because these people actually voted. You call someone on the phone and you ask them who they like, Trump or Biden. You learn something, right? Depending on who they are. Mm-hmm. But who they say they like and who they actually show up to vote for on election day going through all the effort of getting ready and making sure they're registered to vote and whatever else is required in their state and actually voting, that's different. Mm -hmm. It's the same, it's the same difference you get when you talk to people who are like, would you be interested in buying this product, this new razor that shaves your face for you? And it costs about this much. And people might say, yeah, that sounds interesting. I might want that or I might not, but who's actually going to buy it? That's the real question. And you're not going to know that until you see people actually sacrifice their time and money to get the item. That's what we're looking at here. This is people who actually did it, actually voted, which makes it the most valuable information for understanding voting out there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. These are the people who, who are voting. And so they're the people that, you know, that both political parties are trying to sway in the, you know, upcoming elections. There's all kinds of strategies to get people to vote for you, and you often make specific appeals to specific demographics. This is your chance to see if they worked, right? Mm-hmm. If, if, mm-hmm. if your messaging is actually working. We talked, we've talked. we talked about focus groups before where you test it, right? You're trying to know as much about the effectiveness of your message before you make the message. But at the end of the day, 
who actually comes out to vote and why and the complicated world and all the factors that go into it, nothing beats that information. And so here is where, as I said, this is where political strategy is going to begin for the next years. This is what people are looking at. And this, there's a crazy amount of work being done looking at these numbers and looking at the future. So the first thing we want to mention is that this election, there was record voter turnout, more, more than, than any election previously, and, and that is significant. Period. Yeah. 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 More than, more than any, <laughs> any president elected ever, this one had, had highest turnout. Now, when you, when you break it down in ratios of population, that may not be the case, but even broken down in terms of population, this was significantly higher voter turnout than most presidential elections. Especially if you're talking the last, last several elections, there was substantially more people voting this year than other years. And of course, that raises the question of what's different about this year. And, and me and Dan have been discussing that and, and we'll never know for certain. You know, a lot of people would argue it's because of the importance of the issues with coronavirus and the racial inequities and those things drove people out in larger numbers. And that is possible. That is possible. I would argue that the reason this election had more turnout is because of something that was a result of those things, but not because of those things themselves. And what I mean is that it's not that there was racial inequality this year or there was a disease that caused a lot of death. It was the fact that because of those things and because of how people responded to those things, this year has become more politicized than any year in a very long time. That months and months and months before the election, people were talking about politics. People were talking about Donald Trump. People were talking about, you know, Joe Biden particularly, but also about the, you know, the, the liberal movement, Black Lives Matter, and tying that into politics in such a strong way that voting this year felt less like a choice and more like an inevitability. You know, you had to you had to work to not vote. You know, I I would go to work at my warehouse and people would be talking about have you registered to vote? How are you feeling about the election? You know, what did you think about the debates? And people that I did not think were interested in politics at all who were invested seriously invested in this election because it is all anyone is talking about. <laughs> this is just the year about. of politics. It is. And it makes sense when you have things like like COVID-19 puts politics right in front of your face and waves it at you every day, right? You've got <laughs> you've got significant decisions that affect you, like the like the stimulus checks and the the, the shutdowns and those things that are made politically, that are dictating the the details of your daily life in ways that are rarely felt so close. You know, there's always a few groups that feel the, the, the push of government or the attention of government much more than others. And those people are always very motivated. But this year, that's been... It was everyone. That's everyone. That is everyone. Exactly. Exactly. I don't, I don't know anyone who's neutral about shutdowns in terms of like... Yeah. Like, it could, it could happen or not happen and I'd be fine. It'd rather it didn't happen. And the question is, why is it happening? And is it worth it in those, those other issues with COVID-19? No, that's an excellent point, Dan, that it truly has become everybody's business in, in a way that is unique. That it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to just go about your normal life because your normal life is so strongly affected by politics. Yeah. When we've talked about it before, the pressure of, of, of pushing everything through this lens of what can you impose on half of the country who doesn't like it? And that's, that's a, not a safe long trend. It's not exactly a unifying way to, uh, to move forward in the country. No, <laughs> How many absolutely. things can I cram down the throat of people who yeah. don't like it <laughs> one way or the other? So we also want to talk about some of the, the broader categories of, of how people have voted and, and some of the demographics and also some of the stats about about why they voted. You know, one of the one of the things that we thought was interesting is what issues voters thought was important to them 
when they voted. You know, and so the the poll lists a few different issues. They list uh, racial inequality, coronavirus, the economy, crime and safety, and healthcare policy. You know, all of those are are serious issues that have been brought up this year. And and the first thing they do is they break it down by percentage of all those who voted. You know, in this poll, how many voted for each group? And you've got number one is the economy. The number one concern this election was the economy at 35%. 35% of all voters said that that was the most important issue for their vote. And that was surprising to me. I expected I expected that to take second place to uh to to coronavirus, honestly. I I thought yeah. that would have been the number one issue. Yeah, or at least that they would have been close. Or they would have been closer and 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 that wasn't the case cuz coronavirus wasn't second racial inequality comes in at second at 20 percent and then followed by by coronavirus at 17 percent and then crime and safety and healthcare come in at tied for last at 11 percent each and so what's significant about about this is obviously you know the things you expected to be important racial inequality coronavirus were definitely important and crime and safety and and healthcare, while important, did take a back burner. The fact that the economy is number one, as surprising as it is this year, it is the issue that is number one every other year. And most of the time, it's by a wide margin. 35% is low. The economy is always the number one issue. There's a reason that every president has to address the economy and why it's one of the main talking points and everything. And it's, what's interesting is you can probably guess by the 20% who said racial inequality was the most important issue to their vote, you can probably guess about how that breaks down, <laughs> right? 91% of the people who said that voted for Biden. Of the 17% who said that coronavirus was the number one issue for their vote, 82% voted for Biden. In other words, if racial inequality or coronavirus is what you're most concerned about, then you're going to be voting for Joe Biden yeah. versus if the economy or crime and safety is what you're most concerned about, then you're going to be voting for Trump in large, large percentages. Right. 82% for the economy, 71% on crime and safety. Which is, which is not surprising. The healthcare policy one did surprise me. I'm surprised it made the list. But there it is. 11% of people thought it was the most important issue. And of those 11%, 63% of them voted for Biden. Healthcare is always a big issue for the same reasons that we discuss it frequently or refer to it frequently. Uh, it's something that scares people. Yeah, but the biggest takeaway is that a lot of the issues that people people thought were important were important, but the degrees to which they thought were they were important were a little bit surprising. The economy still was incredibly important to people. And those who favored the economy strongly favored Trump. It's a good showing for Trump coming out of this this election. Now, something that we thought was really interesting was the information on rural areas versus city areas. Because it's long been contended that the cities vote for the Democrats and the rural areas vote for the Republicans almost unilaterally. That it's city versus rural. And when you look at a map of the United States, you look at the at the states with larger populations, with more cities, and that tends to be where the Democrats win their, win their electoral votes. And then you've got the flyover states and these large swathes of, swaths of land where the Republicans always win. And we're starting to see that change a little bit. We're starting to see a shift. So in the city, 60% voted for Biden and 37% voted for Trump. And that's about what you'd expect, except you'd expect it to be stronger. You'd expect for more people to vote for Biden and less people to vote for Trump in the cities because that's how it's been presented. Right. A 23% a 23% point split is huge and it's significant. But I still would have thought it would have been bigger than that. I would have thought it would have been like 70-30 at least. Maybe even more pronounced than that. In rural areas, if you look at the 2016 election, so four years ago, Trump versus Hillary Clinton, Trump got 62% of the rural vote and Clinton only got 34%. So close to a swap from the city, except 
In this election, 2020, Trump only picked up 54% of the rural area, while Biden picked up 45%. So in these last four years, Trump has lost the rural vote, and Biden has picked up a significant chunk of that. And in the suburbs, another area that Republicans are supposed to hold fairly strong, this year Biden actually beat Trump 51% to 48% in the suburbs. So so things are shifting. Instead of it being a clear cut between cities and rural areas, while it's still true that you're more likely to be Republican in a rural area and you're more likely to be Democrat in a city area, the shift is taking place and it's it's pulling away from there and it's being it's becoming a little a little bit uh little more shades of gray between these different areas and a little harder to differentiate. It's not as clear cut as it was four years ago. Right. This could be an anomaly year, right? This may be because of COVID-19 and because of these other things. This year, for some reason, there were issues that affected other people more and they, they're, they're voting differently than the norm. And maybe next year it'll go back to the normal proportions we see there. Or this could be the beginning of a major trend that would really reshape politics. If this continues... I, I don't know what to make of it if it continues. This is, this is, this is one of several things here where we're going to point to it and we're going to be like, look at this. What do you make of it? Yeah. <laughs> and, you, and you can, you can go ask your, go ask other people, you know, what they think and see, see what you guys can come up with. Because there's, there's good reasons for the, the normal split, right? For the city to be more liberal and the countryside to be more Republican. And, People have looked into this. There's there's a personality test called the Big Five. It's a five factor model of personality, and it's it's designed to be as data driven as possible, which makes it a really unfun, which makes it a really boring personality theory <laughs> because it's not a theory. It's just presenting data and capturing trends and things like that. And now there have been theories kind of built off of it. But one of the things that it has is a trait called openness. And openness is your comfort and how much you enjoy new experience. And so people who are high in openness, who want lots of experiences and varied experiences, tend to live in the city. And it makes sense. Somebody who's high in trait openness, who grows up in a rural area or in a small town, is going to be less satisfied with it than someone who is less open and is more comfortable with routine and with repetition and tradition and those kind of things. So openness as a personality trait becomes a very strong predictor at the extremes of which party you favor. One of the interesting correlations that is very consistent and very strong and suggests causation, suggests that this may be the root of it, is that people who are very high in trait openness and the trade openness, are very likely to be Democrat. And they're very likely to live in a big city. And they're very likely to any number of other things that correlate with this, right? And so you're always looking for the root cause. Because the question is, are the cities liberal because cities cause people to be liberal? Or is it that people who tend to be liberal tend to like cities? Right. It's which which way does the causation yeah, yeah. flow? Because there's a there's a strong correlation there that but seems to be consistent. It? But what causes it? And so this trait openness proposes a cause that to me makes a lot of sense. That you're that people are self sorting based on temperament, and people who like those things tend to move to big cities. Right. So they this is the the small town kid who just can't wait to get out. Right. And go experience the world. This is somebody high in openness. Right. It's the it's a very standard story. But it's not showing up here nearly as strong as it has in previous years. And so, as you said, is this, is something, maybe, maybe that's not the explanation. Maybe there's something else. Maybe, you know, what is it here that got these people voting this way? Well, and that's a billion dollar question. I was about to determine the next election. And I was about to say is whether or not it continues, the fact that it happened once means that something that happened this year or something about the candidates, or something about how it was presented, mm-hmm. caused these people to change how they yes. voted. And yes. so if, as a political party, you can figure out what caused that change and do more of that, 
in order to get more people or do less of it, you know, depending on what your goal is, Mm -hmm. that can definitely affect the election. Because if, you know, if, for example, Republicans are able to figure out how to capture more of the the city vote, that could make a huge change in their chances of getting of getting the presidency, you know, Mm -hmm. and 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 vice versa with the Democrats, if they can secure more of the rural vote. That can cause a significant change because it's something that we saw in this presidential election is that different states were swapping, you know, were flipping from Republican, Democrat or vice versa that you may not have expected. And that's telling about people are changing their behavior, not just in a normal expected way, but in unexpected ways. And what that means is there's a lot of potential here going forward for people to take advantage of that. And when we say it like that, it sounds very sinister, but in many ways that can be really good because it can cause the political parties to shift, to shift their platform in order to acquire those voters. You know, it's something we've talked about before when we talked about third party voting is it's those people who leave. It's those people who change. It's those people who do something different, who are those who are going to be listened to. And that's something that we're seeing here with these people who are making unexpected shifts. Yeah. It makes, it may, it means we're treading on loose ground somewhat, right? Unsteady ground, but, but there's opportunity in that. And there's, and it's interesting. And as you said, we're, we're discussing this tactically here. We're looking at this as people who would be campaigning in the future, those kind of things. This is how they would think of these kind of things and what this stuff kind of means and what it suggests Obviously, there there are implications far beyond politics in terms of culture and in terms of uh, the ideas and things like that that people believe. In a broader way, beyond that, I we're also talking about the fact that this state of flux is not just a potential opportunity for the two parties, but it's a potential opportunity for us as normal people to to have a shift, to have a shift yeah. in in what's important. And, yeah. you know, it's something that we've talked about before. And this this unsteady ground is a chance for change. Right. I look at it as a positive. <laughs> as someone who is – as someone who wants to – wants things to shift, who thinks there, there are bigger issues that are rarely discussed and those kind of things. I think anything like this is a good sign because it, it's at least potential. So the next category we want to talk about is income brackets. Now, income brackets were very interesting. Because unlike, for example, rural versus city, the delineation, the line in the sand is not nearly as clear when you're talking about rural versus city. You either live in the city or you don't. There's not a whole lot of of middle option. But with income, it's all about where the poll chooses to draw the line. Is it 50,000? Is it 60,000? Is it 70,000? Do you have multiple different categories? You know, every mm-hmm. 10,000 is a, is a question or is it one question, you know? And these all affect what kind of answers you're going to get. And so as we were looking, we were getting some vastly different answers because there were many <laughs> different questions asked. Right. When you've got a large plot of data and you're drawing the categories you're going to discuss, this happens in studies too. Where you draw the lines can make what you want to appear appear or not appear. And, uh, and often it's, it's that simple. When you have things like this, where Brad said, where it's not like it's either A or B, but where you have a scale of possibilities and you're drawing the lines for the categories it makes a huge difference. Absolutely. So for example, on, on CNN, they have a poll, you know, almost every major news network has, has some form of exit polling. And CNN, they have, you know, very early on and on their page, they have two stats for income. They have less than 50,000 or more than 50,000. So divided into those two categories. And then right below that, they have less than 100,000 and more than 100,000. And the first one, less than 50,000 or more than 50,000 doesn't tell you very much. It's, it's not very informative because it says that in both those categories, they're more likely to vote for Biden than they are for Trump. And so when you go down to less than 100,000 or more than 100,000, it starts to change. And it clearly indicates that if you make less than 100,000, you're much more likely to vote for Biden. And if you make more than 100,000, 
then you're moderately more likely to vote for Trump, which seems to indicate that it's the rich that support Trump and the middle and lower class who support Joe Biden. And that's the that's the common impression that people have. That's the idea that people have. And so when you read that, you know, a lot of people resonate with that. They say, OK, that makes sense. That's what I expected. Yeah, you get the businessmen versus the minorities and poor. Exactly. Now, what's interesting is that as you scroll farther and farther down that page and past 30 or so more <laughs> questions, you find another stat about income. And this one breaks it down much farther and has a category for less than 30,000, 30,000 to 50,000, 50,000 to 100,000, 100,000 to 200,000, and then 200,000 or more. And so I was like, why was this not the first? stat listed for income because it tells you way more specific information than any of the other two that, that we already mentioned. And <laughs> and you can speculate about the reasons, but the the results from this study, from this question, I mean, are very different when you cut the numbers in this different way. Because with this study, it shows that under 100,000 you know, those first three categories, you're more likely to vote for Biden than for Trump, which once again is what people would expect. What's surprising is those last two categories, 100,000 to 200,000 and 200,000 or more. Because as we saw above 100,000 or more, you're more likely to vote for Trump, right? That's only partially true. The only category that Trump wins is 100,000 to 200,000. There, you're more likely to vote for Trump than Biden. But if you make 200,000 or more, you're more likely to vote for Biden than you are for Trump. And so what this is saying that the other poll doesn't say is that, yes, Trump does have a strong lead in those who make more, but he's not talking. That's not the uber rich. People who make 100,000 to 200,000 are not the uber rich. In fact, those are usually considered upper middle class middle in class, today's yeah. in today's economy. I mean, those yeah, depending are depending on where they live, they might be middle class. They might be middle class. I mean, if you look at yeah, a large city, that's not that's not a huge amount of money. And so it it completely changes what that poll tells you. And so something you have to watch out for with these polls is how the information is presented, even though neither of those polls up above were lying in any way, right. how the data is presented changes things significantly. Because if you looked at those polls above, you'd say most definitely Trump has support of the uber rich and Biden does not. But this poll lower down seems to indicate that may not be true. Now, granted, this only goes to 200,000. Maybe if we had more data down the line, we would find out that, nope, Trump does have support of the, the uber rich. But we don't have that data, and they're choosing to present which data they present, and that changes how it looks. Right. Depending on how you slice the data, you can make it look like the poor support Biden and the rich support Trump. Without lying, just depending on how you slice it, where you put the lines, where you put the categories. But this is one of the crazy things that I think that this is a myth I would like to dispel from the public mind, is that the rich support Republicans and the poor support Democrats. Whatever you think of both parties, that's not true. Yeah, it's more complicated than that. that the, yeah, that the poor tend to support the Democrats is true. But in terms of where the wealthy put their support... Go look at the largest donors for campaigning. You will find that a significant number of them, of the most important ones that donate the most, are actually unions. And you'll find lots of, you'll find that a lot of the big companies donate to both parties. Mm -hmm. And you'll find that, like, in, and that's actually very, very common. That's not like a one-off thing. very, very common. That's very common for them to hedge their bets and to donate to both. Or to donate to some, you know, depending on what they're doing at different times, to donate to each of them. There's a weird old class warfare myth that still seems to hold sway about the the rich being the the drivers of the of the Republicans, and that's just not true. Actually, all of the action seems to be more in terms of real number differences appears to be in the the poor and the middle classes. It's important to look at the data, as Dan said, because 
a lot of times the conceptions that we have are not as clear cut as we as we think they are. Not as clear cut as we think they are. One interesting category that may be surprising for some reason it was surprising to me when I first read it years ago. Um, this is another one that's constant, not constant per se. It, it ebbs and flows, but is fairly predictable. Women are more likely to be Democrats than men. In this case, women as a whole voted 56% for Biden, 43% for Trump. The question why is really interesting here. And there's a lot of different ideas. And I think several different explanations play a role. Part of it's certainly advertising, right? Democrats make direct appeals to women through feminism and through uh, the ideas of equality and equal wages, all those kind of ideas, right? They're speaking directly to them, yeah. trying to... I'm trying to think of a Republican equivalent. There just isn't one, is there? No, there isn't. Abortion is obviously a big issue that, it, that should be factored into this, but the divide there is not does not line up with this divide, with the divide between Republicans and Democrats. It's more complicated. And so I don't think is actually a driving factor here. Part of why women vote for Democrats, another part beyond the, the specific appeals to them from the Democratic Party, is, I think, accountable to actual gender differences. The evidence we have for differences between men and women is decisive at this point. The biggest scientific journals in the world have been running articles on this lately. To the chagrin of many, men and women have different interests, slightly different, and they have slight, and they tend to be slightly more agreeable. There are small differences at the in the middle of the statistical distribution. They make big differences at the extremes. Not going to go into it here, but suffice to say that the, the the tendency of women to be more agreeable is going to play a small role. In the difference. And where the difference is 56%, 43%, that's about the right margin there for that to, to be explanatory. Except as Brad and I were digging into more of this, we ran into some strange things. And to understand it, we're going to have to look at not just women in general, but women in relation to education. Education is a strange factor in this. So if you look at normal exit polling and you, you look at college graduates, right? How many people who graduated, who didn't graduate high school voted for who? And how many who did graduate high school voted? And how many who have a college degree and then graduate degree? And what you'll find generally is a steady line where the more education they have, the more likely they are to vote Democrat. And if you look at that from that distance, it's hard not to make assumptions. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard more than a few people rub that in the face of Republicans, right? Be like, Republicans, we know why people vote for you because you're stupid and they're stupid and, and the, the data shows it. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's it's not that simple. <laughs> it's not as simple as, well, one party's smart and the other's dumb. If it were that simple, it would have resolved itself a long time ago. <laughs> but you get into the actual numbers and you look at, non-college graduate men, right? We're looking now at education and gender together. Non-college graduate men favor Trump, 55 to 43. Non-college graduate women, 50 to 49. Tied. Statistically, that's even. That's even. Non-graduate women are even. College graduate men 50 to 48. Again, statistically, that's even. College graduate women, 64 to 34 in favor of Biden. That's a strong... It's huge. That's a huge margin. 64 to 34 is... Two to one. Just shy of two to one, right. That trend is really odd. As I said, women tend to vote Democrat. There's good evidence that that's from actual gender differences, and certainly it would make sense that it's because of Democrats appealing directly to them and trying to win them over as a block. But this education thing is weird because non-graduate women, it's even, whereas college graduate women shift immensely. Men shift. And that's men shift, but not as much. That difference between college graduate women and graduate women, that's, that makes all the difference in the world. And Brad and I were discussing it, just trying to trying to you know get a get a feel for why that is, because that actually 
Obviously, that's the difference in between women who vote Democrat and Republican, right? Something there with college graduate women, because the non-graduate women vote evenly. In general, not just with women, but with with both genders when it comes to, to college. Obviously, going to college changes the, the statistical likelihood of who you're going to vote for. You're more likely to vote Democrat if you've gone to college. Now, we don't know causality here. We don't know if going to college makes you more liberal. I know the Republicans would argue that quite strongly, that the liberal colleges make you more <laughs> liberal. Uh-huh. But there's there's also the potential claim that, as Dan was saying before about the openness in the cities, that the people who are interested in going to college are already likely to vote liberal. And this is simply – it's just self-sorting once again. And that could be true with, with women as well, that the women who are choosing to go to college are already liberal, and this is just one way to indicate it. And mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know if it's that. I don't know if it's something about college itself, but it is yeah. interesting. Yeah, this is one of the things that we've discovered looking at these numbers and, and just trying to trying to piece together. I've got to think that it's that it's both of them, that to some degree it's self-sorting. But so many people go to college today – that even if you were not interested in it per se, naturally, if you weren't inclined to it, society pressures a significant portion of people to go to college. And uh, I think the openness, the trait openness could account for some of the going to college. But could it account for such a big difference? I don't know. I've got to feel like to some degree, college education is liberalizing. And I, I do think that's fair to say. I do think that's fair to say. But to what, to what degree each is responsible is, uh, is odd and why it affects the women so much more than the men. Someone someone I'm sure at some point will write a book about about why that is and they will probably be wrong. Because <laughs> it's a because it's a weird statistic and there's something something interesting going on there and I do not know what it is. Right, it's 14 point shift instead of 5 where the men get a 5 point shift. It's 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 big and it's got to be in part because of I mean I've got to think it's in part because of women's studies and different different developments there and uh the, the feminism movement being in large part a college movement that is closely connected right right so the last statistic we wanted to talk about and obviously we saved this for last for good reason is because we talked about it earlier and made made the prediction that we could potentially see a shift in minority votes this election in particular in black votes and that that would be that would be significant. And what's interesting in this election, and something that I think would surprise a lot of people, especially if you consider the fact that Black Lives Matter and racial inequality was something that the Democrats pushed very, very hard, is you'd expect them to gain or stay the same in terms of minority votes and potentially lose in terms of white votes. In fact, what happened, white, if you look at just white people, 42% voted for Biden versus 37% in 2016. But that came from a shift in white men who voted for Biden instead of Trump. That's where the shift came from, actually, was white men who changed their vote. White women mostly stayed the same. They had a marginal change, but the large change came from white men who, instead of voting for Trump, shifted towards Biden. Still more white people and white men voted for Trump in 2020 than they voted for Biden, but it's less so. You know, the numbers are shifting. Trump lost the white support that he didn't think was up for grabs who voted for Biden. And then in the black vote, Trump was able to get 12% of the black vote versus 8% in 2016, something we talked about before. And something that I think a lot of people will be surprised at considering the racial inequality issue that, you know, starting with the RNC, the campaign for making the argument that the Republicans are a party that black people can be a part of did do something. Now, the real question we were asking is, is this a one-time fluke or is this a trend that will continue? Because if it's a trend that will continue... That could seriously change the demographic makeup of the two parties. If the parties are not white Republicans versus Democratic minority populations, 
that would be, I think, a fantastic change for <laughs> for a for number both of parties. reasons. Yeah, yeah, for a number of reasons. Yeah, the vast majority of black voters still voted for Biden. It would be awesome, and as you said, I mean, eight percent change black support to twelve percent is not huge in terms of uh, the total number of black voters. There is no voting group, no way to divide the population in a way that gets you as dedicated a voting block as black people for Democrats. It is it is singular. When you look at the statistics, no other group votes so consistently for one person. Yeah. Black voters voting for Democrats are more consistent than conservative voters voting for Republicans. That's how strong it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> basically, conservative voters, which is basically synonymous with Republican, is less predictive. And so seeing a change in something as ironclad as that is very interesting, to say the least. It is. And assuming that that 8% last election is – is accurate, right? That it was actually 8%. There's going to be a statistical margin of error there. And that the 12% is actually accurate. That's a 50% increase in the amount of black people voting for Trump. That is not a small increase. It's small in terms of the effect of it on this election. It is not small and the potential indicator of a shift. As we've said in previous episodes, if this voting block shifts significantly, the parties completely realign. Right? They begin to look extremely different. Especially because Trump was not the best candidate to appeal to minority voters. I mean, <laughs> that, that's fairly obvious from how, from how he's right. been presented and how the media has portrayed him. Four years from now, you could have a Republican candidate who does a much better job of appealing to those demographics yeah. And could potentially increase that percentage. Right. I've got to. I've got to read that change as not people deciding Trump is good, but people deciding the racism messages and the appeals that the Democrats have been making are bad. And maybe there's a mix of that. But but as you said, Trump is not the the yeah, salesman. Yeah, he really for isn't. <laughs> He's not going to persuade people. Which is that. why. Which is part of why it's so surprising. That even with Trump as the candidate, you're able to see those shifts. And we spent some time going through D'Angelo and Ibram Kendi and their ideas. And as speaking not just to the presidential numbers, but to the numbers in general and, in to, and to the Senate and House races, it does not appear that those ideas have caught on and become as dominant as it seemed like it would at the time. There has been quite a bit of blowback, and I dare say that's a that's a part of the reason why the black vote has shifted here. And looking at the election overall, it is something worth mentioning that the liberals thought it was going to be a landslide. They thought that they were going to sweep the board both in the presidential elections, but then also in the Senate and the House because of what's happened this year. And the fact that they haven't is telling. It is telling for a few reasons. Number one, you know, we've talked before about how, how the media has taken sides on both sides, you know, and a large number of, of those media organizations are so strongly on one side that, that sometimes I think even the media organizations themselves get caught in a bubble that they forget about the fact that they're not speaking for a super majority, that this country really is pretty evenly divided between these two sides. And it's something we've seen as this election has turned out. You know, you look at the popular vote, Joe Biden got the popular vote by several million, which is absolutely significant. But it's far from a supermajority. You know, it's not the 64% we're seeing in some of these areas. It's a little over, you know, 51, 52%. It's not as damning as it's been portrayed. And that's something to think about. One other fact that I think is worth noting here is that enemies who are vanquished through politics do not die and they do not go away. A lot of these issues you have to be, you're going to have to persuade people. And that takes time and it takes, it takes a lot more than what, uh, what politicians that are at the front are offering. 
you know, the people who often speak to speak on behalf of the people and who represent them are rarely making the persuasive arguments. It's people down culture of them or up mm -hmm. culture of them. And the politics seems to be following suit, seems to be following the discussions that other people are having. Because of the outcome of this and because of how negative it's been for Democrats, there's something of a civil war going on right now in the Democratic leadership. They have to figure out a way forward from this. Because this should have been, it's kind of ironic. You look at this and you're like, this is a win for them, isn't it? If mm -hmm. Biden's president. And the pendulum of politics is so odd that it comes in waves. It's not like minor victories here and there and scattered. It's like a wave of Democrats win and then a wave of Republicans win later. And you can, <laughs> when you start to look at the, the way this works, you can predict who's going to win based most of the time, based simply on when they're running and who else is in office in other positions. So for example, the midterm is almost always the midterm election. The term in the middle of the president's four-year term, and this next one will be in 2022, the midterm elections are almost always against the president. Whereas when the president is elected, the other offices almost always go with the president. Yeah, and so we're going to see over these next few years, because it really is a shallow victory for the Democrats, and that's something that they're going to have to deal with. You know, you're going to have to deal with a, a locked Congress that, that may get worse two years from now with those midterms, and it's something that I don't think they were expecting and they're going to have to deal with because they have not had the large wave, the large victory that they were expecting, and they kind of not necessarily needed, but would have been incredibly beneficial for them long term going forward. We've covered a lot of things here and we've talked about a lot of a lot of tactics and a lot of interesting things going forward. But the the last point we want to drive home that we've already mentioned before is that, you know, whether or not you you're happy that Joe Biden won, and you know, statistically half of you guys are not happy that Joe Biden won, doesn't change the fact that there are some significant changes going on, and a lot of those changes are really good. And not just good for the parties, but good for, good for the American people. An opportunity for us to escape a class warfare mentality and even a civil war mentality between those two parties that has reached really a crescendo this year that Hopefully, as these demographic shifts happen, we can break away from that because as we've seen this year, those diametrically opposed parties and ironclad lines in the sand are not going to allow anything to get done and they're not helpful for anyone. And we need to break away from that if we want to move forward. And that's what we hope to see with these trends going forward. With that, thank you for listening.